of Shemot, and our Torah portion is Vayera. And uh, let's turn to Shemot, Exodus chapter 6 and verse 2. But I'm going to do something a little different today. Is this where you want it? Okay. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to talk about the Torah Parsha, but I really believe that, that, that I have something important to share with you all because of where we're at prophetically in time. And I may actually repeat myself with something that I'm going to say today. And please forgive me for that. But I believe it's utmost important, of utmost importance, excuse me. Sometimes when, when Yahweh is bringing something to me or to somebody else, and it's, it's new, you may have to repeat yourself a few times so that it can really permeate and sink in. Because I believe that it is so important that we get this, and that we not only get this, but we teach it to other people, and that other people start to speak of it, that if we do this thing, then things are going to shift for us in a huge way as a people. And that's why I'm going to repeat myself a few times today, but I'm going to try and tie it all in with the Torah Pasha, so I've got a great big task on my hand, but I believe, Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, help me. Help me today. I entitled this message, The Land, The People, and The Power. The Land, The People, and The Power. Our Torah Parsha begins in Shemot, Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. It extends through chapter 9, verse 35. You can look at it in your own time. Of course, many of us are familiar with the text. We're looking at the beginning of the Mishpat, the judgments that come upon Mitzrayim. Why? Because Yahweh says, will you let my people go so that they, Israel, can come and worship me out in the desert. Worship him in Ruach and Emet, spirit and truth. So our Torah Pasha recounts the plagues that were inflicted upon the Mitzrim, the Egyptians, when Pharaoh refused to let the people go. Now for us as the last generation that scattered in the nations, I believe that Yahweh will deliver us from the world and lead us into the land like he did our fathers. If you were to turn to Corinthia Aleph chapter 10, you can see in your own time that Rav Sholiak admonishes the Corinthians they were Greeks, but they weren't really. They were Ephraim, scattered in the nations. He says, all of our fathers, why would he say that to Greeks if they had no connection to Israel? Because they were Ephraim, the scattered tribes, scattered in the nations. And Rav Shaliak Shaul said to them, all of our fathers went through what we're reading about in the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus. They weren't just Greeks in Corinth. They were the scattered northern tribes of Israel that were being harvested and collected in. So in our Parsha we see that the Shemot and the scripture it actually builds to what? Yehoshua, Joshua bringing a people into the land. And for the last generation it will build up to Yehoshua bringing us from our dry bones out here in the nations into the very land of Eretz Israel. Just as in our Parsha, we'll have to endure plagues, cosmic disturbances, and triumph by the blood of the Lamb, and a greater exodus. In Sefer Shemot, the book of Exodus, there are three times three plagues, three times three plagues, and a final judgment. Ten plagues. For the last generation, it's going to be different. There will be three sets of seven way more severe judgments in the book of Gileana. It's going to be way, way greater. If you think this is bad, you wait for the last generation and for those that are not housed in the sukkah of Yahweh. It's going to be terrifying but beyond all belief. Beyond all belief. In Shemot chapter 6 verse 2 it says, And Elohim spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu and said to him, Ani Yahweh, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov as El Shaddai, but by my name Yahweh I was not known to them. Or another translation is, but by my name Yahweh was I not known to them? A question, depending on your translation. And listen to this, and I have also established my Brit with them to give them the land. 
I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land. This is of utmost important and that's what we're going to be talking about a bit today. The land, the people and the power. This is all ties into our Torah Parsha. The land of their pilgrimage where they were Gerim, strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Mitzrim, the Egyptians, keep in bondage. And I have remembered my Brit. Firstly, it's so important for us to get the significance of the name Yahweh and the attribute or name title El Shaddai. Because what we're seeing right here in our Parsha is Yahweh is revealing something about himself through the names that he used when he appears to the patriarchs. Because there's two aspects of covenant established by Elohim. Land and offspring. There's two aspects of covenant that are established by Yahweh Elohim. Land and offspring. I'm going to give you this land and there's going to be a multiplicity of Zerah seed. We're going to be the beneficiaries of both land and we are the seed of Abraham. If you were to turn to Bereshit 15, you can do it now or your own time, you'll notice the Bereshit, Genesis chapter 15, the covenant with Abraham is all about land. It's all about land. And what does Yahweh, how does Yahweh address himself in Bereshit 15? El Shaddai or Yahweh? Yahweh. He addresses himself in Bereshit 15 as Yahweh. I am Yahweh. Because the promise of land is connected to the name of Yahweh. The promise of land inheritance is connected to the name Yahweh. It's connected to Israel. Chapter 15 of Bereshit, if you read it, Genesis, in your own time, you'll also come to see that the promise is connected to Israel's slavery and deliverance from the land of Egypt and the promise of inheriting the land of Israel. That's what it says in Bereshit 15. It's talking about that they're going to go down to Egypt. It's talking about how they'll be delivered with a great arm and they'll be given the land of Eretz Israel. And all the time while Yahweh is establishing that covenant in Genesis Bereshit 15, he's using his name Yahweh. Because Yahweh is about land. But later on, in Bereshit 17, Genesis 17, Yahweh is talking about the covenant and now he's talking about multiplicity of Zerah, seed, and he uses the title Elohim, which is a derivative we get El Shaddai. El Shaddai is used, which is about Zerah, seed, and multiplicity. Two covenants and the two names. So overwhelmingly, when Elohim introduces himself as Yahweh, he's talking about how he'll bring Abraham's descendants into the land. And overwhelmingly, when Elohim introduces himself as El Shaddai, he's talking about the promise of multiplicity in Abraham's Zerah. Have I lost you all already? Because it's early. You're with me? We're good. Okay, all right. When Elohim appeared as El Shaddai, the emphasis of the covenant was on being fruitful and multiplying Zerah seed. But when he appeared as Yahweh, the emphasis on the covenant was on inheriting and receiving land. El Shaddai, El Shaddai and Elohim are both derived from the word El or Mighty One. And it all goes back to Bereshit chapter 1. If you were to turn to Bereshit 127, it says, So the word of Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim he created him. Male and female he created them. And Elohim blessed them. And Elohim said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. The name Elohim is being used, which is we get the derivative El Shaddai. And what's it talking about in Bereshit chapter 127? Seed or land? Seed, multiplicity. You see, because when Yahweh is talking, El Shaddai, Elohim, he's talking about multiplicity. I'm going to turn 75 of your souls, 
or 70, depending on your translation, 75 of your souls went down into Mitzrayim, Egypt, but as El Shaddai, I bring much more multiplicity, multiplicity, I am going to turn you into a huge nation that fulfilling the promise to Abraham. But just a few verses later, in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, excuse me, Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 2, verse 4, Yahweh goes on to say, These are the generations of the Shamayim, heavens and of the earth, and they were created. In that day, Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the Shamayim, heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grow, grow. For Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up on the midst of the earth, and he watered the whole face of the ground. What is Elohim talking about there? Land, and he's using the name Yahweh. This is of utmost importance when the beginning of our Parsha, Shemot chapter 6 verse 2. Because he appeared, if you read the beginning of the texts, obviously he appeared to the patriarchs as Yahweh, but when he appeared to them as Yahweh, he was talking about land. But when he was appeared to the patriarchs or manifested himself there in Mitzrayim as El Shaddai, he's talking about multiplicity, the multiplicity of seed. So in our Parsha, chapter 6, verse 2, it teaches us how Elohim makes himself known experimentally or experientially, excuse me, through his names. Not whether or not he actually used the names. El Shaddai made himself known through the lives of the patriarchs behind the scenes. But now, Yahweh is about to become intimately involved in the affairs of man in relation to deliverance from the land of oppression into the land of promise and he's going to judge the surrounding nations. That's what we're going to see in our day too. Because the importance of the name of Yahweh, not Hashem, not the Lord, is connected to what? Land. See, when you come into the Nazarene Israelite or Messianic movement, you'll be like, oh my goodness, why are those guys, they're always on about the true name. I mean, my goodness. I mean, you just say Lord and they just jump all over you. Why are we so jazzed up about Yahweh? Because we are the people that have a connection to the land. We are a people that have a connection to wanting to go back to the land to realize that this land is Egypt, that we're in slavery, and that we're going to be delivered from it, and that we do not have a love for the world. We understand the importance of the name Yahweh. It's all about a people connected to a land. That is what Israel is about. You can't be Israel if you don't love the connection to the land. In fact, it says, and I won't read it, but you can turn there in your own time, in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 16, there's actually going to be a whole separate book for people that love and use and meditate on the name of Yahweh. That your name will be written in a whole separate book outside the Lamb's book of life. There is another book for you if you love the name of Yahweh because you're a people that are connected to the land. And that's pretty important. I mean, that's why I don't compromise on the name. I mean, I'd be gracious to those that are coming in and learning it because I, w I grew up with Baal, the Lord. But Yahweh establishes covenants. And we see in this week's Torah Parsha too how he establishes the covenant with the seven I wills. If you turn to Sh Shemot, chapter 6, verse 6, he goes... And this is where we get the four cups of Passover come from these I wills. I will bring you out. And we get the first cup of the Pesach Passover, the cup of sanctification. He says, I will deliver you, the second I will. That's where we get the cup of instruction or the cup of deliverance. The third I will, I will redeem you. Of course, this is the cup that Mashiach drank the cup of redemption. He said, I will not drink of the next cup until I'm in the Malchut with you. 
He drank the cup of redemption, but he did not drink the fourth cup, I will take you the cup of praise or the cup of peace, the messianic kingdom, taking the people into the kingdom as his bride. And then the fifth, fifth I will, I will be your Elohim. The sixth, I will bring you into the land. And the seventh, I will give you a heritage. These are the seven I wills. And it goes to establishing covenant. Because back in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 17, the Avrahamic covenant is established with seven I wills. The covenant that we live in now, the Brit Hadashah, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, that covenant is established with, guess how many I wills? Seven I wills. Yahweh is manifesting something to his people, the establishment and security of covenant through the seven I wills. Whether it be right here in Shemot, Exodus chapter 6, verse 2, whether it be in Bereshit chapter 17, or Yirmiyahu chapter 31, verse 31. I am having a pain in the backside with this microphone today. Could be because I've got this crazy mullet thing going on. Need a haircut. Be quiet in the back. <laughs> Who's hot in here? It's smoking hot, isn't it? Good night. Whew. I mean, we're all jazzed up, aren't we? Let's be honest about coming into our identity. I am Israel. Hi, I'm Ephraim, you know. But try talking to somebody when somebody comes up to you and they grab a piece and they go, what are those dangly things you got hanging on your, on your, on your underwear? Thanks to you. <laughs> are you Jewish? What do you, what do you do at that point? <laughs> try and explain, well, no, you know, I'm actually not. I'm actually from Ephraim and the ten northern tribes. They got scattered and they look at you like, oh. Right, okay. But we're all jazzed up about our identity. We're Israel, we're Ephraim, and some of you may be Jewish. But we have an emphasis of our returning identity as Ephraim because identity is everything. And in the Messianic and Nazarene Israelite movement, you've got the two house theology, but so many of the people that are coming in were those that thought that they were Gentiles in the church and then have woken up to their true identity as Israel, Ephraim Israel, and so we have this strong emphasis on identity. It's very important. But what happens if you misidentify a place? What happens if you misidentify a people? And what happens if you misidentify a power? You're in a whole lot of trouble. We're so so much emphasis on the identity of Ephraim. So much emphasis within the Messianic movement on... It's, well, it started off as Messianic Jews, did it not? But it's now morphed into their... Oh, hang on, there's more coming out of the nations than there are Jews. So you start to understand that this is actually the ingathering of the tribes into the whole house of Israel. And we're so jazzed about the identity of Ephraim. I'm Ephraim, hi! But, what happens if we're misidentifying a people? What happens if we're misidentifying a place? And what happens if we're misidentifying a power? We've got to get it straight, and that's why I really wanted to take this time to talk about this today. Firstly, if you misidentify a place, a people, or power, you fail in prayer, prophecy, and protecting Yahweh's end time people. If you misidentify a place, a people, and power, you will fail in prayer, prophecy, and protecting Yahweh's end time people. Let's identify a place. What is the true biblical Israel? Now I was hoping because somebody took me aside 
last week or the week before and spoke to me. And I was hoping to have it here today, but I think maybe next week, we'll see. But we have this very nationalistic flag back here that everyone noticed. This represents the state of Israel, which is a predominantly right now full of Jewish Israel. But I've actually ordered a flag too of Ephraim. Because really, what needs to happen is Ephraim needs to fly a flag on the one stick with the house of Judah because we are supposed to be coming together into one. Amen. We can't be so focused on the Mug and Darweed and the state of Israel that we forget something. It's Ephraim and Judah coming together. Let's not misidentify a place. What is the true biblical Israel? It's not the political entity called the State of Israel. True biblical Israel is not yet gathered out of the nations. It remains scattered throughout the world as well as within the Israeli state. Now let me make a clarification here before I get kneecapped. Anti-Semitism is an abomination. Anti-Semitism, mind you, should not be confused with legitimate criticism of Israel or Israeli policy. You can be opposed to Israeli policies without being anti-Semitic. It depends how opposition is expressed and whether the criticism is reasonable. I'm going to use the scripture or text to investigate and criticize the present policies of Israel in regard to Ephraim and biblical prophecy. The birthright is the land. The birthright is the land. Bereshit chapter 12 verse 1. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1. Now Yahweh said to Abraham, get out of your country and from your Mishpacha family and from your Abba's Bayit house to a land which I will show you. The birthright is the land. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 15, verse 8. In the same day, Yahweh made a Brit covenant with Abraham, saying, Till to your Zerah seed have I given this land. I want to talk about Israel and the Melik Sadiq or the Malkitzedic priesthood, because this is very important for us. Abraham entered into this land covenant 430 years prior to the establishment of the Levitical order. When Avraham offered up his tithe to Malkitzedek, it was under the Malkitzedek order of priesthood, was it not? You tracking with me so far? The land covenant of Israel was always to be administered under which priesthood? Malkitzedek. The land covenant of Israel was to be administered under the Malkitzedek priesthood, not the Levitical priesthood. That's why under Melech Dawid, King David, a Levitical priesthood, a greater Israel was never fulfilled. Never fulfilled. Under the Levitical priesthood and King David, the greater Israel, the promise given to Abraham was never fulfilled. Oh sure, he amassed the greatest amount of territory, but it was never the fullness because it has to be orchestrated underneath a Malkitzedek priesthood. Avraham paid tithe to Malkitzedek. It was the Malkitzedek priesthood that established the land covenant to Avraham. Now that should blow your mind. That should be a paradigm shift. And you may not get it right now, because there's a lot of information that's going to go forth, but that should blow your mind. Because that's a paradigm shift. That is a paradigm shift that is so massive. If you grasp this, it's going to change your walk. It's going to change the world. Because you are kings and priests under the order of Malkitzedek. Yosef, Ephraim, you are kings and priests. You hold the testimony of Mashiach that's brought you into the Malkitzedek priesthood. And now he's returning you to the Torah, the desire for the land covenant. Why? Because you're going to see an expansion of land. An expansion that you have never ever witnessed before. If we can understand people, place, and power. If not, then the Messianic movement will just continue on the way it has been for the past 50 years, never fulfilling what it has been established to fulfill. Because the time of Yosef is at hand. 
If we understand what is being delivered to us, it's amazing. Israel and the Malkitzedic priesthood. Avraham entered into this land covenant 430 years prior to the establishment of the Levitical order of priesthood. When Avraham offered up his tithe to Malkitzedic, it was under the Malkitzedic order of priesthood. The land covenant of Israel was always to be administered under Malkitzedic, not Levi. That's why under Melech Dawid, and the Levitical priesthood, greater Israel was never, I repeat, never fulfilled. Yahweh told Avraham that he would be the father of many nations, Yaakov Israel, that from him would come a company of nations. So who are the nations that are saved? Who is the treasure that's buried in the field? The field, of course, being the world. Who is the treasure that's buried in the field? It's Israel. Yahweh says throughout scripture that Israel is my treasure. None other than the 12 tribes of Israel. All 12 tribes of Israel are Yahweh's treasure that is buried in the field which is the world. For each tribe of Israel to be, is to become a nation in and of itself. So if you obey the commandments of Torah and believe the testimony of Yeshua who gathers the flock then you are Israel. Judah provided the king, Yeshua, and Yosef provides the birthright, the kingdom. Judah provided the king, Yeshua, but Yosef, the house of Yosef, or Ephraim, the ten northern tribes, they provide the birthright, which is the kingdom, and this is the time of Yosef right now. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 48, verse 15. Bless the lads, Ephraim and Manasseh, let my name, Israel, be named upon them. The name of Israel goes upon Ephraim and Manasseh. The name of Israel did not go upon Judah. Yet we have the Jewish people in a land that's called Israel, but the scripture says the land of Israel, the title of the name Israel goes upon the house of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. And you wonder why biblical prophecy fails. I know I'm repeating myself, this is very important though. First Chronicles chapter 5 verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. The birthright is the land given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah acted insolently over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright, the land, is Joseph's. We missed it. Didn't we miss it? Fifty years, we've missed it. Oh, and guess what? Yeshua's coming back. This Yon Teruah. No, he's not. Oh, no, it's going to be three years. Let me give you another timeline. And I start to question. I go, well, hang on a minute. We're looking over in the Middle East and going, it's Israel. It's Israel. Therefore, prophecy, Bible prophecy is starting to be fulfilled. And Joseph's still out here in the nations. And Yahweh says, Israel is for Joseph. They Ephraim and Manasseh, my name Israel shall be upon you. Joseph must return with Judah into the land together for it to be prophetically, biblically a powerful time of Israel. The kingdom is given to ten Israel, Ephraim or the ten northern tribes, not Judah. First Kings, Melachim Aleph, chapter 11, verse 30. Behold, I will tear the kingdom, the kingdom of course is the land, is the birthright, out of the hand of Melech Shlomo, and I will give ten tribes to you, speaking of Jeroboam, and I will take the kingdom out of his hand, Solomon's hand, and give it to you, ten tribes. And to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Yerushalayim, the city which I have chosen for myself, to put my name there. So I will take you and shall reign over all your heart desires and you shall be king over Israel. Notice again that the birthright, the land is given to Ephraim, 
the ten northern tribes. Because Judah cannot build the Malchut, the, the kingdom of Yahweh. Jewish Israel alone cannot build the Malchut of Yahweh. Biblical prophecy is going to begin to be fulfilled when Judah sees the need to unite with Joseph and establish biblical Israel, not the other way around. Legally, according to the Torah, Judah or the Jewish people can't own any land without Joseph. Judah has tried to seize the birthright, the land, by force from Joseph. That's why biblical prophecy continues to fail. You know, we have to have a supple heart towards Judah and the leaders of the state of Israel and pray that Judah's heart will soften towards Ephraim and that the leaders of the state of Israel will soften and open their hearts to the greater Davidic Israel. We need to pray for that soft heart. And those of us that love Israel, we need to be careful not to be caught up with an unbridled love for a nation living in sin, which is nothing more, of course, than idolatry. So keep your love for Abba Yahweh and Yeshua, his son, and further the expansion of the kingdom to all lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now back to our Parsha, it says in Shemot chapter 7 verse 13, Exodus chapter 7 verse 13, and he hardened Pharaoh's lev heart so that he listened not to them as Yahweh had said. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Pharaoh's lev heart is hardened, he refuses to let the people go. We don't want to have a hard heart to Jewish Israel. We do not want to have a hard heart to the state of Israel. We want to have a soft heart because Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But we need to check what is in our heart towards our Jewish brethren and check what is in our heart towards the state of Israel. Because the heart of Pharaoh in chapter 7 verse 3 the Hebrew word is kwasar. In chapter 10 verse 1 the Hebrew word for a hardened is kabad. But in all other eight cases when there is the hardening of the heart the Hebrew word is chazak and it means strengthened. You see Yahweh strengthened Pharaoh's heart. Whatever was already in his heart, Yahweh just strengthened it. Whatever is already in your heart and my heart, Yahweh will just strengthen it. So we have to be careful and have a contrite and broken ruach and broken heart before Yahweh because if we are carrying something around in our heart against the Jewish people, against the state of Israel, Yahweh will just strengthen that and it will be your downfall. So with all of this message about the return of Ephraim, be careful what is in your heart. Who is an Israelite then? Well, A, an Israelite is any descendant of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, whether believer or unbeliever, whether of the house of Judah, the Jews, or any of the other tribes. And B, someone who belongs to the true Israel. The true Israel is a theocratic nation presently in dispersion around the world, including within the secular political entity called the State of Israel. Consisting of all those who have accepted Yeshua and are walking in his Torah. These people may either be A, Israelites, the true blood descendants of Yaakov, Israel, or B, non-Israelites, once Gentiles, who by their faith are grafted into the vine tree of Israel and become Israelites by adoption. Does that make sense? That is the Israelite people. So what's the biblical view of Israel? Well, Talmudic Judaism isn't of the true biblical pattern. Let's get that straight right out of the gate. How can we know today who a true Israelite is? Well, anyone who accepts Yeshua and who walks in his commandments, his new covenant Torah, is a true Israelite, whether Ephraimite or Judahite. What then should we have to do with Talmudic Judaism, the state of Israel, and Zionism if they're 
counterfeit of the true messianic faith and the true theocratic state which Mashiach is king of? These are questions that you might want to ask yourself. What should we have to do with Talmudic Judaism, the state of Israel and Zionism if they're counterfeits of the true messianic faith and the true theocratic state which Moshiach is king of? Because modern Zionism inspired the eventual creation of a counterfeit Israel which has a man who is a secular prime minister. The only true Israel has who? Moshiach as king over it. So many believers have been duped in supporting an anti-Yeshua counterfeit. I mean, this is shocking to some of you. But if someone's got to tell, put it out there. May as well be me. I'm used to getting slack. I've got it for years, it seems. I'll sit down and think about that. So many believers have been duped in supporting an anti-Yeshua counterfeit. They're supporting a state run by a religious clique that loathes Yeshua who blasphemed the true Mashiach. Many have been duped to believe that the existence of the Israeli state is proof that biblical prophecy has been fulfilled. You see, they've been duped into prophesying timelines and calendars and second coming ideas based upon the incorrect assumption that the state of Israel is biblical Israel thus affecting prophecy. Only the tribes of Joseph have the right to the name Israel forever, not Judah. I've established that through scripture. When the tribes of Joseph return to the land, then biblical prophecy regarding Israel will begin to unfold. But I just spoke recently to some Messianic Jewish brethren, a couple, that actually made Aliyah to Israel and lived over there and they tried it several times and they said it was awful. They said, you don't realize how they absolutely hate Yeshua and any believers, even if you're Jewish who love Mashiach over there. He said, it's so hard, your light just gets snuffed out. But we over here, you can have this love affair, but the reality of it is that we need Joseph and Judah to unite together. Well, does that mean that there are two Israels? Well, there actually is. There's an awakened Israel as well as a fleshly, carnal Israel. Rav Sholiak Shaul, the Apostle Paul, puts two distinct Israels forth in his letters to the Romans and the Galatians, does he not? There's not two physical Israels, don't get me wrong, and there is not a replacement of Israel. But there is an awakened Israel and a fleshly, carnal Israel. Now the northern kingdom of the ten tribes is called Israel in scripture and never the southern kingdom, which is always called Judah. The first Israel is physical, with the glorified eternal Israel, which is spiritual, coming later. Spoken of in Romeo chapter 9 and Yochanan. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Avraham's children. It is not the natural children who are Eloah's children, but it is the children of promise who are regarded as Avraham's Zerah, offspring. A man is not inwardly a Jew if he is one outwardly. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Ruach. Children born not of natural descent, but born of Eloah. So the fleshly natural Israel is born of human descent, but the eternal awakened Israel is born from Yahweh Eloah above, exclusively apart from human descent and without reference to the human descent of those it inhabits. So something that I've been listening to and something that's very troubling and I've, I've hear it often times is you get these brethren, they may, might have a Hispanic last name and all of a sudden 
boom, internet genealogy surf, search, oh, well, I'm Sephardic. And then you get somebody else, they do it, they look at their last name, boom, I'm actually from the original tribe of Levi. Boom, somebody else looking at a genealogy search, in fact, they pull a little blood out, spin it through a machine, and they are from, oh, guess it, the house of Judah. Can we not read scripture? Rav Shaliak Shaul, do not give yourself heed to endless genealogies. The only blood that you need to be focused on is the blood of Moshiach. Any other blood is of no importance to you. Do not give heed to endless genealogies. There is neither Jew or Greek, Aramean. You are neither male or female, slave or free. You are all echad, one, equal. There is no distinction in Mashiach. Why do you care? If you really wanted to be honest and truthful, why wouldn't you say that you were a Maranos? Because that doesn't quite have the ring. A Maranos is... Uh, uh, somebody of Spanish descent that converted to Christianity under fear of death and got mixed up. That is more true than saying you're a Sephardic Jew. But it doesn't have quite the ring of authority that you can lord over your brethren. You see, because it's not about genealogy. But I hear this so many times and then you get these brethren coming into the Messianic movement and teaching and teaching and they'll say things like that. went off on a rabbi, rabbi trail, rabbi trail, sorry about that. I get passionate. I really do. Fleshly, natural Israel's identity is rooted in the flesh. If you're fleshly and you're natural Israel, then maybe you should do a genealogy search. But I thought we were awakened Israel. So why are we giving heed to endless genealogies? Because fleshly, natural Israel's identity is rooted in the flesh, but awakened, eternal Israel's identity is rooted in the inner man or the Ruach. The state of Israel is national, it's racial, and it is compared internationally. Awakened Israel is without national nationality, but it's transnational and without national racial comparison. It's trans-tribal. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what race you are. Moshiach is above all and for all. There is, it doesn't matter. Because awakened Israel is trans-tribal. It's for all people. Because the only blood that you're focused on, Dharm, is the Dharm of Moshiach. Avraham never inherited, inherited the land in, its origin, in his original lifetime, did he? Avraham never inherited the land in his original lifetime. This means that the promise of the land has an application to the eternal Israel, seed of Avraham or the Israel born from above. That's you guys. That's Yosef. That's Yosef. That's awakened Israel. Because when Yeshua, the Messiah, came to earth, he came not only as saviour, but also as king. The political entity called Ju Judea, run by the Romans, with the help of the Pharisees, Sadducees and scribes, was not the theocratic nation of Israel, was it? Its inhabitants were Israelite Jews, true descendants of Judah, mixed up with various others, Samaritans, Greeks, etc., who were following an apostate mosaic faith. You see, people forget that. Isn't that what Mashiach said to the Pharisees? You see, we forget that. They were following an apostate mosaic faith. Amongst those apostates, of course, was a minority of true believers of the Torah who recognized their Mashiach when he came and who became the true continuation of Israel. Those Israelites who rejected Yeshua were literally cut off or broken off from Israel, the olive tree, and those who had lived as Gentiles and who believed Yeshua were grafted in. It was the beginning of the return of of the house of Ephraim. But then what happened? Constantine got hold of the message and now you have 1700 years where nothing happens for returning Joseph. 
But now the message again has come back into the hands of Joseph, so we are picking up the baton of the second century. Do you understand that? We are picking up the baton where it was dropped in the second century. We are only a few hundred years from when Mashiach walked on the earth in the way that we are thinking and reading and understanding the scripture. That's why we're banging together. That's why we're working these things out. We are going all the way back to the Hebrew roots of our faith. This is exciting stuff. But when brethren come in and try and sidetrack you with an impressive Jewish genealogy, well, I'm a Sephardic Jew, you know, really be careful. If they're going to be honest with you, they'll say that they were Maranos. That would be biblically honest, okay? Let's be real. Because I can do a genealogy search and show you that I'm Jewish too. All of you can. Well, I'm actually from the house of David. Give me a break. Somebody come up here and slap me. I mean, really? <laughs> Why? So I can just get up here? Maybe I should put that table back here and I can sit behind it like I used to and lord myself over you. I mean, really? Is that what we've come to? It's sickening. Why? Because I see it because I used to be that way. But it's until you come down and we all just come together humbly and say, you know what, we are brethren. We are sheep in a pasture. Let's get into a safe place together. There is none above the other. We are all echad. We all have different gifts. Sure, I've been gifted to teach the word, but you have important gifts too. But when you start lording yourself above your brethren, you're never going to be a part of regathering. You're going to be a part of scattering. And that's what happens. And that's what happens. So anyway, Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. We're never going to get out of here tonight, the rate I'm rattling on. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob. The remnant are Judah. Is that what it said? The remnant of what? The remnant of Israel and such have escaped of the house of Jacob. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 6, verse 13. The remnant tithe is to be harvested to form the leadership of the end-time messianic community under the overall leadership of Ephraim hidden in the nations. Now you have to be careful because if you go to six different congregations, they're all the remnant, okay? Everyone's the remnant. So you have to be careful. Just go to the scripture and find out what the remnant is. The remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob. Yeshayahu chapter 10 verse 20. Don't believe my words. Check it out in the scripture. Judah can only be called Israel when the tribes are united as one, Echad, under Joseph's headship. When the kingdom, the Malchut, split, Judah, Benjamin and Levi made no attempt to call themselves Israel because they knew they couldn't. So they picked Judah after the, the most powerful of the three southern tribes. Joseph, which is Ephraim and Manasseh, is to be restored to rulership once he is purged of his Gentile pagan tendencies. To be a theocratic governing tribe during the millennium under the Jewish king Mashiach. I hope that helped you understand identifying a place, identifying Israel. Did that help you at all in understanding that? Because what we have in the state in the Middle East right now should be identified as Judea or Yahuda in its present state. Now, am I saying that, it, that they made a mistake calling it Israel? No. I believe it was prophetic. But they have not allowed it to become Israel because they will not open up immigration to the house of Ephraim. Now, did David Ben-Gurion, did, did, was he given a vision? Did he have a vision and, and knew, knew that the vision was Israel? Yes. 
But the present secular leadership in the state of Israel has limited it, so if it stays the way it is, it should be called Judah or Judea. My prayer and hope is that the vision of David Ben-Gurion, Israel, will come to fruition, which means that 12 tribes unite together and the stranger with them. So that's identifying a people so that we can know who a people is. I'm all over the shop tonight. But now let's, that's identifying a place, but now we need to identify a people. Because we're all excited about I'm Ephraim, I'm Ephraim high, but what about Judah? Like I said, be very careful when they start talking about genealogy. But who is Judah? I mean, I just read an article in the, in the, in the Jerusalem Post last night about uh, an, a, a Muslim fella that grew up in Kuwait that is now saying that he's Jewish based upon something that a rabbi in Canada says, but because he's gone through all the conversion classes, it's okay that he's Jewish. And you're like, what? Boggles the mind. The Jew. Giliana, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Excuse me. And to the teaching overseer of the Israelite congregation in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and is alive. I know your mitzvot your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Yahudim, Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of S.A. Tan. For none of those of you shall suffer. See, S.A. Tan shall come some of you into prison, shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, that you shall have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful to death, and I will give you the Keter Chaim, the crown of life. Now, this is not a reference, don't get me wrong, this isn't a reference to Jews in general. It's a rebuke of those former Gentiles or Ephraimites in Smyrna who didn't understand their identities as members of the commonwealth of Israel, who were non-Jews or non-Jewish Israelites yet they were insisting on calling themselves or pretending to be Jews, which is, like I said, prevalent today within the Messianic movement. Now it's too cold in here and people are putting their jackets on. In fact, I had an email the other day and it came across and this person was saying, I'm from the tribe of Levi, the original Semites. Again, focusing on genealogy. Presently, presently, the leadership of Israel is mostly the Khazarian converts from the Caspian Sea region, who came into Europe and then immigrated into Israel after the Shoah, the Holocaust. Israel mistreats the true sons of Shem, the Sephardic Jews of Israel, and other Semitic peoples like the Flashars, the black Jews. The European Karzari converts call themselves Jews when they are not. They originated out of an area near the Caspian Sea called Karzaria, and there is plenty of history to validate this. After Khazaria's dismemberment, they ended up settling in Hungary, Poland, Ukraine, Kiev, and other parts of Europe. So you have to be careful. Shemot, Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. And the Jewish people journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot, and there were men beside children. Does it say that? According to Judaism, it does. Shemo, Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. And the Jewish people journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot, and they were men beside children. I don't know how many times I've spoken to rabbis, Orthodox Jewish rabbis, and I try and t talk to them and say, well, Ephraim's out there in the nations. Ephraim wants to come home. 
Well, then Ephraim, the rabbis, will say, well, he needs to convert to Judaism. I'm saying, but a mixed multitude left Egypt. He said, no, they were Jewish. I'm like, no, it was a mixed multitude. He said, no, but they converted to Judaism and then they left Egypt. <laughs> but I said, Ruth, what about Ruth? Well, she converted to Judaism. I'm like, she did? They're like, yeah. It, it, I'm sure it's somewhere in the, in, the, in the rabbinical writings. I'm like, oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> but it's not in the Torah. It's not in the Tanakh. What about Naaman the leper? I mean, these people would be disqualified as Israelites. Because according to the scripture, the line goes through the female? No, it goes through the male. The line goes through the male, but Judaism today traces the line through the female, the mother. You see, so genealogy is of absolutely nothing in the biblical narrative. What about in Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23? Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23. This says Yahweh Sevoth. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all of the languages of the nation, even shall take hold of the seat seat of him that is a Yahudi, a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that Elohim is with you. So should, this is the question I'll pose to you, should a returning non-Jew take hold of a Jew who hasn't experienced the promise of biblically ordained redemption? Should a non-Jew who is returning to the house of Israel take hold of the seat seat of a Jew who hasn't experienced the promise of biblically ordained redemption? Surely the Jew of Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23 must be one who can lead others to redemption and not Torah study alone. Because Torah study alone without redemption is what? It's mere Jewish Gnosticism. And there's a lot of that around. Gnosticism, the seeking of knowledge. The pursuit of knowledge. There's three types of Jew. There is a Yehudite, a Judahite. A Judahite is a true blood descendant of Jacob's son, Judah. To be a Judahite, you do not have to be 100% Jewish. Blood lineage, according to the word of Yahweh, is traced through the father, as opposed to the false modern Jewish mother line. They say they are Jews and are not. The promise in scripture that pertain to the Jews are to these literal descendants of Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Judah. Number two, a Judean or an Israeli. A Judean was a citizen of the now extinct kingdom of Judah from the time it became a separate country following the death of Melech Shlomo until the final dispersal by the Romans after the Bar Kokhba revolt in the second century of the Common Era. Since 1947, a new state called Israel was formed and passport-holding citizens of that country are known today as Israelis as opposed to Israelites. An Israelite, like a Jehudite, is a literal descendant of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Israel. Whereas an Israeli is a citizen of a modern political entity, the two are not the same. Am I just stepping all over your theology today? <laughs> or your politics? Okay. Third, a Jew. Now this is important. Although Jew appears in the Brit Hadashah, this is incorrect. Sometimes it's inserted into the text. You know, like the Feast of the Jews. It's not the Feast of the Jews, it's the Feast of Yahweh. It's been inserted into the text. And Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was nigh. No, some Greek inserted that into the text. And Passover, the feast of Yahweh was nigh, maybe. So sometimes it's inserted in the text when it's not even there, or elsewhere it should be translated as a Judean. In other words, the New Testament Jew is in reality a citizen of the now extinct Roman province of Judea. 
a distinction is made in the Brit Hadashah between the southerners, which were Judeans or Jews, and the northerners, the Galileans. A Jew, in the sense that is used today, is a person who subscribes to Talmudic Judaism and is a religious designation. The vast majority of Jews today are not descendants of Abraham at all. They are not Jews. In other words, most of them who call themselves Jews today are in fact Gentile converts to Judaism. You see, that isn't told to you. The vast majority of Jews today are Gentile converts to Judaism that traced a lineage that is unscriptural through the mother when the scripture says, I mean, you see how upside down this is? Talmudic Judaism is not the religion of Avraham's descendants. There's three groupings. The Jew, who is a literal descendant of Judah. All Bible prophecies about Judah pertain to these people. Two, the ancient Judean or modern Israeli, who were and are citizens of political entities. The Bible says nothing about either of these because Israel is not a mere political entity. The Zionism of the Jews of the Israeli state is not the Zion or the Zion of the Millennial Kingdom or the Zion of the former Israelite theocracy. Third, the Jew who, subs who subscribes to the religious, religious faith of Talmudic Judaism. This Talmudic Judaism, which is a combination of the Mosaic law, human tradition and occultism and Baal worship. It's militantly, militantly antichrist. It's a religion, not written Torah. And I've just stepped over everyone's um, stuff right there. But what about Messianic Jews? Are they the true Jews? Must brethren become Messianic Jews in order to be true biblical Israel? Because some look upon Messian Messianic Jews as kind of super scholars and bow down to them as they do the state of Israel. And Messianic Jews are trying to lord it over their Ephraimite brothers. I've seen it at the conferences. I've seen it in the assemblies. I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. A purging of the Messianic Jews and its false te teachings has yet to take place. There is, biblically speaking, no such thing as Messianic Judaism or Gentile Christianity. There is no such thing scripturally as Messianic Judaism or Gentile Christianity. Moshiach did not establish two houses but one. It's time to bring Ephraim and Judah back to Torah together. That's what we're looking at right now. That is what Rav Sholiak was out there doing in the nations. And then Constantine got hold of the message and it got put on the sidelines for 1700 years. But you, you, you are right there picking up the baton. But if we have this fascination for the state of Israel in its present form, Messianic Judaism, genealogy chasers saying that they're Sephardic Jews when they're not, then you are never going to move forward because you'll have this this love affair with the super Jewish scholars that you'll never come into your own as Ephraim, as Joseph and say, hang on, the name of Israel is upon me. The name of Israel is upon you. The promise of land has been given to you. Stand for what you are. You are the people under the order of the Malkitzedic priest. Doesn't matter if you're black, doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're Chinese, red it matters not because Yahweh is looking to regather his people from all nations. It has got nothing to do with blood lineage but the redemptive work of Mashiach. Nothing. Nothing. We have to purge the occultism of Judaism and false teachings. False teaching that is out there. Mashiach did not establish two houses but one. It's time to bring Ephraim and Judah back to Torah. Yahweh is in the process of creating Messianic Israel. And Messianic Israel will ultimately spell the death of both Gentile Christianity and Messianic Judaism. Both are contaminated from different sources. They are. They're contaminated from different sources. Let's talk about government for a moment. 
Because Messianic Jews, Nazarene Jews, have no right to govern and, and dictate to brethren coming out of the church, or Ephraim for that matter. All Malchut, kingdom responsibility, is the responsibility of Joseph or Ephraim. Judah has fulfilled its responsibilities by bringing forth the Melech, the king. Judah has retained the Melech, the king, the messianic line, but has lost the rights to the birthright, which is kingdom. Many messianic Jews belittle others and strive for self-elevation, riding roughshod over the brethren. There is no rachamin and there is no chesed. There is no mercy and there is no kindness. And it's, it's prevalent. It's prevalent. You see, Judah has not, and you won't hear this, Judah has not been given the mandate to govern the house of Israel. Judah has not been given the mandate to govern the house of Israel. Joseph has been given the mandate to govern the house of Israel. That is a birthright kingdom responsibility that rests alone with Joseph Ephraim. Any Jew... Messianic Nazarene who tells you that he has the right to govern Israel is an imposter. Because there is a unification that is about to happen. It is between New Covenant Judah and Ephraim and it hasn't yet taken place. And it was just about to start to come into fruition in the second century. There is still enmity, hostility and rivalry between the two houses. Ephraim isn't keen to change because he loves his traditions as much as the New, the New Testament Judean Pharisees, Sadducees and scribe love their traditions. For which of course Mashiach rebuked them, didn't he? Messianic Judah has grown proud and arrogant and like the Judeans following Solomon's death who tried to lord it over the northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, they're trying to lord it over Torah observant Ephraimites today as well as to bring over some false Talmudic Judaism into the faith. And foolish Ephraimites who have swallowed propaganda are, and are only too willing to defer and kowtow to modern messianic equivalents that wrongly assume to be theologically superior. And that's what we do. But who are the Jews as far as Yahweh is concerned? They are only one. Jews who are scattered across the world in all nations, including the state of Israel, and two, Messianic Jews, those descendants of the patriarch Judah who have received Yeshua and those who are adopted into that tribe. Because the unification of Judah and Ephraim is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. And it's not a Messiah versus Torah issue which we've been duped to believe. Well, they've got the Torah and we've got Messiah. We've been duped to believe that that's what it is. It's not. Well, all they need is they need Yeshua. We've got Yeshua and now we've got the Torah, so we've got our part sorted. We've been duped to believe that. That's not it. What it is, is which is the governing tribe of the 12 tribe messianic confederacy. That's the issue. That is why it's going to be hard for us to come together. Because you can have Torah and Yeshua, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Ephraim. But which of you is going to submit to what the word says who has the authority of the name Israel? and has the governing rulership over the 12 tribe messianic confederacy. That finishes today when we look at identifying power, which is all about transference of the scepter, the rod of rule, which we spoke about at the end of Genesis, Bereshit. We have to identify the people correctly. Not all Jews are Jews. And do not give heed to endless genealogies. We have to identify the place. 
the modern state of Israel has not fulfilled the biblical pattern of Israel. Therefore, prophecy will fail. And we must identify power. If we continue to kowtow down to messianic Jews that you want to lord themselves over you, if we continue to let the occult teachings infiltrate our ranks because they were brought in by so-called Jewish super scholars, beware, beware, because they are both corrupted from the same source. And Yahweh wants us to do a new thing. Jewish and Ephraimite coming together as one. We are equal together. Transference of the last set of the scepter. The last Jewish king was Zedekiah. Thereafter, it passed to the heavenly king, Moshiach Yahushua of the tribe of Judah. Yahshua is now the theocratic sovereign of Israel, not the Israeli state or Israeli republic. In the patriarchal blessings given by Yaakov, Jacob, to his sons, the longest are given to Judah and Joseph, which is Ephraim and Manasseh. Because of the prominent roles, both would play historically. I hope that I'm not going on too long. That am, I lo am I losing you with your attention? little bit? We okay? We all right? Okie dokie. The longest of the blessings are given to Judah and Joseph because of the prominent roles both would play historically. Judah's authority extends to the time of Moshiach who represents the fulfillment of Judah's role. But thereafter it is Ephraim or Joseph who receives the ascendant position. He is the prince among his brothers, verse 26. His millennial principality as the ruling tribe being foreshadowed in Joseph's lordly rule not over the nations represented by Egypt but also over the 12 tribes because Joseph became an economic and political savior to him at a time of great peril when there was great famine. And you wonder why here, as Ephraim is returning to Torah to the tribes, that we're concerned about bringing in grain. We're concerned about bringing in grain and plundering Egypt. Why? So that we can go to Jewish Israel and say, come and take shelter. Join together to fulfill biblical Israel. We have a position and an authority to do what we're doing. Matt and Amy, what they're doing. Because it's been that way from the beginning. Joseph is the one that had the understanding of what was going to go on. You go to a Jewish synagogue and you, are, and you know what? Most of them have voted for Obama. Supporting this system. But Joseph is saying, no, this is a broken system. We need to make preparations. There is going to be famine in the land. We better start getting ready. So that when the tribes come together, that we can take care of our brethren. Jewish Israel, Ephraim Israel. That is what we're doing here. That's amazing. That's amazing. You go into a Jewish synagogue and you ask them, what they, well, where, where's the barley? Where's the rice? Where you got that stuff stashed? They'd be like, what? How's your security? It's not very good. That's why they're constantly, constantly under threat. Lost, my, lost track. Finishing up, for those of you with twitchy bottoms. <laughs> See him twitching. <laughs> the sons of Isaac, Anglo-Saxons, sons of Isaac. Historically, I think you'll find this interesting. Historically, it was Ephraim. Not, it was Ephraim to the north, Europeans,
but principally to the Anglo-Saxons who brought the Jewish Messiah to the world through the British Empire and then the British Commonwealth by means of the, the Hebrew cubit. Queen Elizabeth I employed the mystic, mathematician, linguist and astrologer and Kabbalist John Dee as her naval advisor. He formulated the British statute mile based upon the Hebrew cubit. And maritime dominance spread and the Christian version of the gospel came about by the correct measurement of distance, the Hebrew cubit of 25.20 modern inches, the statute mile. What am I saying? The Anglo-Saxons, Ephraim, the house of Israel, gets scattered into the nation. Ephraim and Manasseh predominantly in the nation of England. Where Queen Elizabeth I employed the Jewish mystic who established the British or the Great British statute mile of measurement based upon the Hebrew cubit. That then the British Navy could then sail and take global dominance all over the world where then upon they, their ship they put the Christian version of the Gospel of Messiah and spread it to the nations. But it all was dependent upon how they could navigate through the seas. The British could defeat the Spanish Armada, the Spanish Armada, excuse me, and sail around them at night and in heavy cloud. Why? Because of their navigation nautical skills which were established upon the Hebrew cubit. Because the message of Messiah, the Christian version, went out on those ships with Christian missionaries to Africa, to Australia, to Papua New Guinea, all over the world from the Anglo-Saxons, the sons of Isaac, or remnants of the scattered northern ten tribes. There's a fabulous book on it, Stephen Collins, right? The Lost Tribes of Israel. Because Ephraim, if you look at the flag that we'll have in here, and if you read the scripture, Ephraim, whose branches would climb over a wall. But Ephraim's Christianity was corrupt, was it not? That version that went out on the British ships was corrupt, was it not? Just as Messianic Judaism's version is corrupt also. And so Ephraim's political authority over the nations was brought to an end when? In 1947 and onwards. You see, the Ephraimite and Manassite nations, Great Britain and the United States respectively, are no longer Christian nations, but belong to the liberal socialists. They perform their tasks, just as other Israelite nations have performed theirs. Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph, is however to be restorer of rulership once he is purged of his Gentile and pagan tendencies to be the theocratic governing tribe during the millennium, not as an imperial power as the former British Empire, but as servant rulers under the Jewish King Moshiach. Every nation contains Israelite blood. When Abraham was promised that his seed, Zerah, would bless every nation of the earth, that meaning was literal. That his descendants would interbreed with the Gentiles and thus bless them and multiply. The Israeli state is not actually Israel or Judah for that matter. Because Yahweh has a purpose for the existence of this political religious entity. And, his, and he has a purpose for Talmudic Judaism which the Talmudic Jews never dreamed of, much as he had a purpose for the Roman Catholic Church in its pre-Reformation heyday. Without the Talmudic Jews, we might not know as much about Torah as we do. And without the Catholics, we would never have had the Christian Europe or the Reformation. You see, they're used for a purpose, but there comes a time when their usage is no more. It's all about dispersing seed, dispersing the message, dispersing the message. And I'll finish up with this. Remember the parable of the fig tree. You see, Jewish Israel is trying to run the state of Israel. It's putting forth the leaves, yet not producing the fruits of the kingdom. 
because the only way that they can do that is by linking themselves with their legal heir, Joseph. It's time for Judah to make Teshuvah and receive Moshiach and bear fruit. You can't just put forth leaves. If you just put forth leaves, what will Moshiach do to the tree? Cut it down. It's time to produce fruit, which is the ingathering of all 12 tribes with the kingly Moshiach as the head, not a prime minister. What happened in 1948 is the fig tree was brought back to life to allow it to bring forth some more leaves for a season and then cut it down if it still remained barren of fruit. Finally, in Luke chapter 19, if a country and its citizens refuse to let Mashiach reign over them, then Mashiach says, those who don't want me to reign over them, slay them before me. Do we understand the words of Mashiach in relation to the citizens and to the modern state of Israel today? Because when we look back to our Parsha, the book of Shemot and the Exodus, and then we look forward to the greater Exodus, it is a mixed multitude that are leaving Egypt with great signs and wonders going to the mountain. And it's all 12 tribes defeating their enemies and inhabiting the land of Israel together. What is happening in the world today? And the forces that are building around Israel can you show me in the scripture, when you read the scripture, have you come across it? I haven't. When Israel has won a battle when it has just been the tribe of Judah that has fought against its enemies. Because victory of the biblical proportions that we read about in the ancient texts only happens when the tribes are united together. Otherwise there's devastation. That is the tree being cut down because it's brought forth leaves. But a tree that is going to produce fruit is when it can gather in all 12 tribes and then be victorious over its enemies. We are at a time that is so pressing upon the modern state of Israel. We are at a time which is so pressing upon our Jewish brethren and our brethren in the churches to wake up and understand that we are the 12 tribes of Israel that will return to the Torah as our legal document of rule and understand that we have a Moshiach who is the legal one to bring judgment to us all. Then we can put aside our calculations on calendars and timelines because we understand that Moshiach is the one that will bring the right judgment. Because the people that have been really pushing forth particular timelines and particular days and this, that and t'other, really what they want to do is just lord themselves over you and be right. They want to be right and prove that you're wrong. I'd rather be wrong and walk in righteousness. Will you do that with me? If we can do that together, we don't need to be right. We just need to walk in righteousness together. And our, our, our assembly will grow because we will be gathering, no longer scattering. I've been wrong, you've been wrong. But when we act righteously towards each other, that is what brings in the tribes together, because we understand authority. The authority, we understand honor. That all authority and honor is given to one of the tribe of Judah, that is King Moshiach. He's the one that can bring us and pull us together. Rav Shaliak Shaul, the Apostle Paul, was going out and giving this message. He had gone so far with this message and then Constantine picked it up and now it's been sidelined and now the message is being picked up again, the baton is going out and you're the people. You're the ones that you see in the book of Masa Shlechim, Acts, from Pontus, Galatia and all of these places and you're going, why on earth were all these people coming to the Feast of Shavuot? Because they said, hang on a minute, we're not Gentiles. Ephesians says, for you who were once called Gentiles, and to the Corinthians, that your fathers passed through the sea. Your fathers were delivered by the outstretched hand of Yahweh. But be aware, because there will always be those that say they are Jews that are not, that will come in and try and usurp and lord authority which isn't theirs over you. Because the authority, the scepter, 
the authority has been transferred from the house of Judah. It will depart from Judah when Shiloh comes. How can it depart from Judah if it still rests in Judah? You see, these are the things that we've spoken about. This is the time. This is the time of Joseph. And I'm not the only one that's saying this. Many people are realizing that things need to change, that we need to gather. So I do hope that we can put the flag of Ephraim up here alongside. And you notice that I changed the picture back there because that's the message. It's the two sticks coming together in one. That is Yehezkel Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 15 through 28. It is Jewish Israel and Ephraim Israel bound together under the rulership and hand of Mashiach. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Hallelujah. At this point we shall put...